Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Back on the line with us is Katrina Glogowski. She's an attorney and angel investor. She's going to be here talking about the four observations from the first ever Cannabis Investor Day. Katrina, thanks for being back on The Talking Hedge. Morning, Josh. So this Young Finance kind of talks about uh, a, a little meeting that the Canadian Stock Exchange had with the OTC markets that's over the counter marketplace. Um, and so they kind of get into some conversations and four observations or four key takeaways. Um, getting into this article real quick, it talks about the uncertain regulatory environment in the U.S. that hasn't stopped the cannabis industry from putting down roots in the secondary market. Today, there's more than 200 cannabis-related cannabis companies that trade on OTC markets, which is an alternative trading system that offers more efficient access to public markets for early stage companies, enabling them to grow their shareholders base while creating liquidity for investors. So according to Jason Paltrowitz, Executive Vice President and Corporate Services at OTC Markets, this trend is a direct result of legacy financial systems such as exchanges not always being receptive to emerging industries like cannabis. He says, quote, the capital raising, capital formation, secondary market infrastructure really hasn't changed in any significant way in a long time. The one constant has been that the financial system really does underserve not only just small cap companies, but new breeds of businesses. And he'd say that cannabis is one of those. Agreed. So last month, the Canadian Stock Exchange and the OTC Markets had an Investor Day, which is a joint investor conference. There were 177 cannabis companies that cross trade between OTC and the Canadian Stock Exchange. And so we have four observations, number one being that the cannabis market is still dominant by retail investors. So the average cannabis stock is down 50% in the last 12 months. Enthusiasm for retail investment side doesn't appear to have fallen proportionately. The top 10 cannabis companies that raised the most money on the Canadian Stock Exchange in 2019 were all cannabis companies, according to the exchange. These are for first movers, Josh. They're trying to get in early, uh, get the green rush going. Right. Yeah. Anytime you have, uh, you know, new speculation, new markets, you can see Bitcoin kind of doing that parabolic straight up and then kind of straight down. We've seen, you know, 62% correction overall in the industry. So a lot of that was speculation, waiting for Canada export to Germany, for example, and just that slow rollout not really happening. And so a lot of people taking profits off the, off the table. Right. So the CEO of the Canadian Stock Exchange, Richard Carlton, said that you're not looking at a heavy component of institutional investment yet. The fact that you've got a heavy component of retail investors means that you have to think about and look at the market perhaps a little differently than your prospective peers. He notes that many of these are cause investors, meaning that they believe in a mission of cannabis. And to kind of relay that to the, the real world, I guess, the non-cannabis world, um, looking at Tesla, that company is a financial nightmare and yet it's still publicly traded still floating out there because people believe in the ev model absolutely and you see that in cannabis as well mm -hmm. so cause investors will follow you irrespective of where you trade so the second observation is the the source of funding that's changing so i find this really interesting so 2018 deal types uh hadn't changed from 2018 to 2019 in terms of ipo that stayed the same at four percent and then when you're looking at equity being issued last year it relatively stable from this year 34 versus 36 percent what's interesting is the the RTO reverse takeover, which is essentially buying an already existing publicly traded company that's a shell, then you just change the name. It's like a blank check company. That uh, last year was 51%. This year, only 14%. What did go up was all debt. Convertible debt increased 5% last year to 23%. Debt went from 5% to 20%. And then debt settlement went from almost nothing to you know, 2%. But all in all, that's, you know, 40, almost 45% uh, straight debt. Josh, I think this syncs up with what we were talking about last week, where the industry is normalizing mm -hmm. and consolidating. And mm -hmm. I think both of these charts indicate that. Absolutely a form of consolidation, but also normalization because if once there's uh, enough understanding in the industry to accept debt, then you know that there's something behind it. So when you, when you normalize and professionalize the industry by 
by issuing debt instruments, debentures, uh, convertible debts, whatever it is, you're basically telling the industry, we've got collateral, this is legitimate. And so let's offer these other financing rounds uh, other than just equity. Um, and so as we see kind of these normal uh, structured deal types kind of increasing cannabis as opportunities, uh, hopefully we'll see more scale, more expansion, more automation, I agree. And you're going to see in entrepreneurs giving up less and less equity because the risk is being minimized mm -hmm. and using debt as a finance instrument is just further indication that the, the risk is normalizing. Observation number three, it's where, not the who. So when asked about the biggest cannabis trends in 2019, uh, both the CEOs of the Canadian Stock Exchange and the OTC markets agreed that the growth has been the international market. So 2018 was all about U.S. multi-state operators, according to Carlton. He said that this year he's seen a lot of geographic diversity, that companies aren't necessarily as big, but they're coming from different parts of the world. Specifically, he cited the listing of the first cannabis companies from Asia, Colombia, Italy, Denmark, and the Netherlands, and added that the Canadian Stock Exchange has recently signed a memo of understanding with Jamaica, allowing Jamaican companies to also list in the Canadian Stock Exchange. Israel has been a global leader for a long time. Uh, and so, yeah, just the internationalization, commoditization. Absolutely. Normalization. It's an agricultural crop and you cannot grow cannabis outdoors anywhere in the universe. You know, that's got to have sun, got to have water. This, this last week, Canopy Growth um, kind of laid off some of their Latin American workforce. So I was a little surprised having seen cultivation be the second half of 2019's dominant um, kind of bucket for investors as the first half was multi-state operators. Second half was a lot of these producer processors, but I would think that Canada having export agreements would take advantage of that Latin American market, keep producing flash freeze it, you know, make products, uh, import it, export it, do something, but to lay them off, I think is an indicative of probably a, a wider issue that they're having. Uh, otherwise they would continue as regular ag and keep producing. I think Colombia is going to end up on the world stage for a lot of this growth just because of their climate, mm -hmm. uh, the cost of goods sold. We've talked about that in the past. Uh, it's a business. You have to make money. And cost of goods sold is the lowest in Colombia right now that, that I've ever seen for an agricultural crop. So why is Canopy pulling out, laying off? I, I can't speak on that. But I don't think it's because it's too expensive. Mm. I don't yeah. think it's because the business model doesn't work because everybody else is in Colombia. Mm -hmm. I yeah, don't know why. They're, they might be getting some pressure from, from their parent company, uh, Constellation Brands, that put in four and a half billion. I'm not really sure what's happening behind the scenes, but I would agree that the, the labor makes that cost of goods sold so attractive and the terroir makes the, the potential product um, so desirable, potentially, I, I am a little bewildered as to why they would be stopping uh, manufacturing product in, in one of the best, cheapest, most affordable places in the world. I guess we'll find out. Well, I'll be interested to learn why. Come back to the talking hedge. Yeah. Observation four is uh, watch out for these trends in cannabis. So again, the CEO of the uh, Canadian Stock Exchange and the OTC markets said that in a panel, uh, they were asked their thoughts about industry moving 2020 beyond. Um, the Talking Hedge will have their own crystal ball predictions in December with the panel. And so um, Paltrowitz, the CEO of the OTC market, said that they're going to see a lot more consolidation in M&A, just like you said, Katrina. Um, Paltrowitz goes on to say that he'd also like to see there be a little bit more thought from the institutional investors mindset into the U.S., so back to your point about M&A and consolidation, definitely going to see a lot more of that as the pain points step in, um, you know, with harvest season, low price points, we'll see seven and eight cents a gram uh, for, you know, million gram plus flash frozen uh, post harvest. And, and a lot of these companies we won't see next year. Uh, I, I, I agree that again, as the market normalizes, so will the price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and something I've been saying, uh, you know, way back uh, in March uh, on our early panel that we did talking about um, 
decoupling prices from Canada to the United States. So Carlton, he's a CEO of the Canadian Stock Exchange. He said one of the things that uh, they'd like to see is a decoupling of valuations between U.S. multi-state operators and Canadian LPs because the correlations have been too high. So that speculation in Canada will pop. And I think it's going to be to the detriment of U.S. companies as investors look at them through a valuation, like any other value stock, right? They're going to, they're going to do all their due diligence. And I think they're going to undercut a lot of U.S. companies as a result of that initial speculation, maybe out of fear, maybe out of greed. Um, what do you see in your crystal ball, Katrina? I see the U.S. market is totally different than the Canadian market. Canadian, federally legal across the board. You can bank, not easily, but you can bank. And most importantly, the Canadian government allows for export. Uh, the United States is so far behind. And if you are looking at an Aurora, a Tilray, a Canopy, and saying med men in the United States should be val valued along the same lines, you do not understand the market because they are totally different. Yeah, MedMen isn't, uh, isn't exempt from those layoffs. They just announced having to lay off a bunch of people too. And like I've said on this podcast before, it's just going to take a little bit of a decline in commercial real estate for that company to feel a massive pinch in the same way that we work did. Yep. So they shouldn't be linked. U.S. is different than Canada decouple away. Point made. So David Lackman is a managing director of Benchmark. He said 2020 is going to be about the haves and have nots. In other words, who has cash and who does not? Who has expanding margins that are worthy of investment and who does not? There are very few public companies in the space right now that are earning a profit. And that means that the runaway for, for burning through the cash on the balance sheet is a reality that firms are facing. Having a war chest, making sure that you can afford to, to be a going concern. Uh, you know, we um, we reported on the podcast earlier about new opportunities for advertising. If you can't afford to advertise on the mainstream media, then you're probably already going to be irrelevant, especially those CBD companies who really don't have anything to differentiate them. Those cannabis companies that aren't, you know, mainstream brand names like um, Charlotte's Web it's going to be these early entrants that first mover advantages to get your name and brand recognition and go multi-state. And without that, that, that war chest, without that capital, without being able to advertise, you're going to go to the wayside in, in the next M and a wave. I agree. I don't think that the safe act is going to be the band aid that everybody thinks it's going to be because it doesn't direct the FDIC to issue insurance. Uh, it says, Oh, we won't bother you, but, Ultimately, this is an FDIC problem. This is not a banking problem. I mean, Bank of America and Chase would love to have your cannabis account, I guarantee it. Uh, but they don't wanna put grandma's security at risk. So what does this mean? This means your company is not gonna get money from Bank of America or Chase, you know, standard money in 2020. Even if the SAFE Act passes, I don't think you're gonna have normal access to capital. So you had better have cash in your pocket. The investors are getting savvy. The investors are, are figuring out, you know what, cannabis is not a guarantee. Uh, there are good businesses, there are bad businesses, and you had better have the cash to ride it out, especially this grow season. You got to get through it. You, you have to. And without cash, where are you going to get it? So the Senate is going to be taking a look at uh, the, the Moore Act on Wednesday. It's supposed to be the first vote that the Senate has on descheduling cannabis. Um, I give it a 1% chance of, of passing. This is about money. This isn't about descheduling or, or legalizing yet. You need a financial collapse in order to be forced to do anything. And so that trillion dollar infrastructure budget that's already been passed, they're waiting for a collapse. Cannabis legalization, waiting for a reason. Uh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna pass right now. That, and, and the gal that initiated it um, doesn't have any backing to really get that thing passed anyways. It's, I don't pay attention, I don't talk about bills except for the marijuana bill, the, or excuse me, the marijuana lounge bill because I'm drafting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see that as a, as a business uh, value add 
not to say descheduling and legalization isn't, it's just uh, something I don't cover. Laws and bills I don't cover because it's boring. <laughs> they aren't going to get passed. I give it a 1%. So, uh, you know, for Chris, who, who, uh, who commented, I appreciate it, man, but uh, don't even bother worrying about it. It's not going to happen. Nope. Uh, and they took up descheduling this past summer and they declined to deschedule it. Why anybody would bring it up so soon after they just said no, I, I don't think it's going to pass either, Josh. She's a Democratic um, presidential candidate. And so she just wants to be cool and against Joe Biden. Hey, well. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the fact that they're even going to hear it is, I guess, a, a move forward. Um, most of the time they would just kind of move that along. But the fact that they're even willing to hear it, I think, speaks volume. And so, you know, set your watch because that's an indication that things will move. They just want to know what to do when they need to. And that's right. not happening now. <laughs> well, maybe she has a crystal ball that I don't. And they realize the SAFE Act isn't the, isn't the Band-Aid to give cannabis companies access to traditional banking and deschedulization is, is what is actually required. So maybe she's onto something that we aren't. I think between her and Bernie, it could easily be something that they implement and have it pass when it needs to be passed, right? This is all about finance and money. And so when there's a, an economic correction and there's a significant uh, banking collapse and housing and, and car and student loan collapse, uh, they're going to need to generate revenue somehow. And they're going to look at all options and cannabis is definitely on the table. And so it's just a matter of time. Yeah, especially for the states in the middle that haven't legalized yet who are going to be desperate. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we will report on bills that do matter. You're just going to have to come back to the talking hedge and find out which ones they are. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Golgowski. She is an attorney and angel investor. Appreciate you being back on the talking hedge. Thanks a lot, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. By the way, if you enjoy the content, please show your support with the cushy gesture of $4.20 a month on The Talking Hedge's Patreon page. This will kind of help me spread the word. I've been asked to speak all over the world uh, from Toronto and Colombia, Spain, um, Miami, all over, Tokyo. But your support's important to me. I haven't monetized the podcast. I want to be as authentic and transparent as possible. I want to avoid conflicts of interest uh, or even the perception of paid opinions. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or pay me on the Talking Hedges Patreon page or don't and I'm out.